message, Christmas blessings. And the most interesting thing happened on the way to preparing this message. I wanted to, uh, to preach on a verse, and, and I didn't even realize where it was found in the Bible, but it's a verse that I learned from my mother uh, at Christmas time. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And she said that once. She said that to me a hundred times. And, and, and I thought she was just didn't know what in the world she was talking about. Right? Because all I knew was go see Santa, make a list, uh, you know, the joy of getting Christmas presents as a child. But over the course of my life, uh, I remember, I think it was as a, a, a teenager, I started to think, well, I had a few friends or my parents, I'd like to, and I started working, I'd like to get them a present. And before long, the excitement about getting presents had almost disappeared. And that joy of giving someone a present. And then, of course, once I met Gwen, I wanted to give her the world. Uh, and then children... And, you know, um, and so I learned that my mother knew what she was talking about. <clears throat> but, uh, and I wanted to talk with you about that, but I had a second agenda. I wanted to talk with you um, on my first official Sunday uh, about uh, what kind of pastor I want you to help me be. <laughs> um, and I... I thought, well, Lord, I, I want to do the Christmas message on it's more blessed to give than receive, but I really want to talk to them about what kind of pastor I want to be. And the, the story I knew without going to look that I wanted to use was Paul's farewell address <clears throat> uh, to the elders at Ephesus in Acts 20. <clears throat> That's what I wanted to talk to you from. And you say, well, why do you want to talk on your first Sunday about, about saying goodbye. Uh, because in that powerful story, Paul reviews with them what kind of pastor he had been. Uh, and, and he says in there, you know that from the first day until now how I have conducted myself. <clears throat> so I thought I wanted to talk with you about how I want to conduct myself and how I want other leaders of this church to conduct themselves and how I want you to pray for us and, and, and what kind of church we want to be. And do you know that the Lord resolved my problem of wanting to do two things at once um, by having me go back and read Acts 20? And I got down to the very end and when Paul was talking to them about, about how the Lord had supernaturally worked it out financially for him to stay among them for three years, right? then he said, and as you know, Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I could have fallen right out of my chair. I didn't know that was in the book of Acts. Jesus said it. And you know, if Jesus said it, it's either in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or in the book of Revelation, where he's talking to John from beyond. Uh, but I found that there is actually one saying of Jesus, one and only one saying of Jesus in the Bible that's not found in the Gospels or Revelation, and there it was. Paul quoted Jesus, and that saying, Brother Jack, it's more blessed to give than to receive, which until I was about 18, I thought my mother wrote that. <laughs> I didn't know that, that's, that, that Paul quotes it, but it's not in the Gospels, and it's not in the future revelation. This is something that people heard Jesus say, and it was passed on to Paul, and it's the only saying of Jesus. And so, do you see, to me, that's a miracle, that I wanted to preach on Acts 20, but I also wanted to preach on it's more blessed to give than to receive for Christmas, and in my own ignorance didn't realize that that was found in Acts 20. All right? Now, once you go out and say, our pastor's so humble, he bragged on his ignorance. Uh, uh, because I'm just sharing with you. I, I just didn't even, I didn't know it was there. I mean, I was flabbergasted. Uh, do y'all know that word? 
I was discombobulated when I saw that, and I thought, my goodness. So there's a little story about this message. Now, I love Acts 20. <clears throat> in Acts 20, Paul's in a hurry. In fact, it says that in one of our first verses. Paul was, in, Paul was hurrying. And I thought, well, that's a good, that's a good text for Christmas. Have, is there any time when you're more hurried than Christmas? All right, do, do you ever feel less prepared? <laughs> is there anybody who said, I'm totally prepared? I mean, thanks to being snowed in for so long, I have wrapped all of our presents, right? And on the first day that I could get out of the driveway, I had made a list of what present, who I didn't buy presents for, and I shot out and got them and came back, and yesterday I finished wrapped, wrapping them. But still, do you have all your Christmas cards? We're all driving over here today. Oh, we need to send a Christmas card to so-and-so, right? And isn't it, isn't it that way this time of year? Paul was hurrying, and he was in a double hurry. He had gotten way up in northern Greece, and then the Lord put on his heart a desire to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. And he only had a few weeks and he couldn't get on a greyhound or hop a plane. Uh, he had to work his way by walking and by taking ships. But along the way, the Spirit had spoken to him through prophets, telling him that he was going to be bound in chains and thrown in prison when he got to Jerusalem. And yet he kept trying to get there, but thinking that this may be his last chance, every church he passed that he had planted, he wanted to stop there and pour into them as much as he could. Right? When he got to Miletus, for example, or was it Troas, in one of those places, he got there and he only had one night to speak to them. So he preached all night. He started at supper, and he preached until the sun came up. He almost get distracted when a teenager sat in the window. That's a dangerous thing with a long-winded Pentecostal preacher. He sat in the window in the upper room. And, <laughs> and he fell out, landed on his head, and died. <laughs> so Paul went downstairs, and they prayed for him, and the Lord raised him from the dead. And Paul went back upstairs and started preaching. And it said the people paid more attention after they got back upstairs. Uh, and, and he just kept, around midnight, they had a little break in this sermon because a fellow died. But that didn't stop him. Now, um, I, so Paul was hurrying and hurrying and hurrying. So let me, uh, let me just read this to you. You might wonder what's the difference between teaching and preaching. Well, one difference is, that uh, you read a text when you're preaching, uh, and then you take off talking about it, right? Hopefully effectively. <laughs> if you're teaching, you read through a text, and you tend to stop and remark as you go through it. Uh, and, and Jesus preached, and Jesus taught. Uh, and there's no rule to say you ought to, do, you ought to do this on one day of the week, and you ought to do this on another day. Right? And poor me, I try, whenever I try to preach, I end up teaching. And whenever I, I try to teach, I get excited and throw my notes away and start preaching. Uh, so sometimes you don't know, even know what you're supposed to do until you get in there and start doing it. <clears throat> so I wanted to read this to you. My intention is to make a few remarks, not talk long. And then there are, I want to draw out of this story five prayers that I want to ask you to pray over me, my family, over all the leaders of the church, including uh, when we get a youth pastor, when we get someone for this or that as we move along, that these are the things. And, and what I'd like for you to do is either cut off the bottom part or fold this and stick it on your refrigerator or stuff it in your Bible where you'll be uh, reminded uh, to pray. So before we get to those five prayers, and that's really all I have for you today, I'm going to ask you to, to pray for us. Um, in Acts 20, New King James Version, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus. Ephesus was 30 miles inland. 
Uh, he landed at Miletus on the shore. He's trying to get back to Jerusalem. Um, and he knows, having just left Ephesus, in fact, they ran him out of town, if you remember. Uh, he had been there for three years, the longest he ever stayed with any church. And he knew if he went inland, it might, he might not make it back for Pentecost, so he's in a hurry. But then he can't just bypass them, so he sends and asks them to come meet him there. And they just have one evening together. And so this is, and, and, and he knows and they sense that they'll never see each other again. And it's true, they never did. And in fact, it's very touching at the end where it says they, they prayed together and then they fell on each other's necks weeping. These are people he'd been through the battle with uh, in Ephesus and turned that city upside down. For Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so he wouldn't have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying, there it is, to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders of the church. And when they would be the people who he had left to pastor the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day, that I came to Asia. That Asia is a Roman province, Asia Minor. Uh, it's what we would today call southwestern Turkey. And he knows from the first day in what manner I always lived among you. And I've underlined some verses that'll, that contribute to the prayers I've written. Um, Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. In other words, I taught, I taught in your homes, I taught in the town, I taught where we met together, um, and I didn't hold back anything from the word of God uh, that I was supposed to teach you, testifying to the Jews and also to the Creeks. To the, to the uh, Greeks. In other words, I wasn't, I wasn't just here for the white people or the black people or the Hispanic people. Or, uh, I, I was here for everybody. And what was the message? Repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to repent to be saved, and you've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That, folks, is the gospel. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. I love that verse. There's a sermon in that one. None of these things moves me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. Uh, that's one of my goals. I want to finish my race with joy. Right? Um, I want to say, like Paul said, uh, my life is like a, a, a drink offering. I've been poured out on the altar. I have nothing left. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that, that, that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. And I imagine they started to tear up at that point. <clears throat> Therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And I'm telling you, whenever we leave this place, whichever way, however, whenever, right, um, I want to be able to say that, that I don't have any innocent blood on me. In other words, that there's not anybody who needed to hear the gospel and they came to church or they counseled with me or they were around me and I didn't tell them. That I didn't tell them what? The gospel. That they're a sinner in need of a savior. That Jesus is, has all of the answers. That the blood of Jesus can, can cleanse us of all sin and only the blood of Jesus. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun and you know the gospel. And... And there are many, many preachers who are going to have pastors who are going to have to give an account one day and have the blood of the innocents on them. And it, one of the first things the Lord had me to study, read, 
after I accepted the call to preach, first thing I read in the Old Testament, was, uh, and I, I wasn't planning to tell you this, but it's Ezekiel chapter 3, and it says that uh, if, a, if a person dies in their sins and you did not tell them, all right, then their blood I will require at your hand. And I thought, Lord, I didn't know it was going to be this serious. <laughs> No. I mean, Ralph, that's the first thing he had me read in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. By the way, I, I love verse 27 and 28. Let me read 27 again. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole gospel of God. Right? 28. Speaking to the leaders, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I love that verse. I love that verse. Uh, for all of us as leaders, starting with the pastor, we got to watch how we live, right? And we've got to pay attention to the flock because Jesus died for them, right? And, and, and I've never been a shepherd. I've never been a shepherd. Uh, Ralph's the only person I know that ever raised sheep, right? Uh, <laughs> um, and Susanna ought to know something. Her, her father was a shepherd, different kind of shepherd, but still, right? <laughs> Um, and so I take this very, very seriously. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Does anybody know that will happen? And sometimes, verse 30 says, they rise up from within the church. For also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things. That is, crooked doctrine. And why do they do it? To draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. If, you, if your pastor is not crying, something's wrong. Right? And I don't mean crying during the sermon all the time, but I mean there, there are times. I know there was a Sunday I kind of didn't say much. I kind of cried all the way over here and cried all the way back. I think it was the second Sunday in November because it was abundantly clear that, that we weren't going to get any help and we probably couldn't stay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and yet you were in our hearts and it was a bad, it was a miserable day and I probably didn't preach much, too good that day, right? <laughs> probably hollered a lot or something. Uh, you know, I just... I, didn't, I just didn't know. In fact, I told Gwen, I said, well, this might be our last Sunday uh, over here. Um, and so you, you, you want that, you want those tears. Um, so now, brethren, verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. That word is edify from Greek uh, and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. We're not just a Pentecostal church, we're a holiness church. I, I didn't have anything to do about your hair, that's your heart I'm talking about, okay? I have coveted, and then Paul talks to him, and, and I hope you'll come to know this is true, we're not here to get rich. We do enjoy paying our bills. It, I have found that life is more satisfying when you can pay them, all right? Winford's got some great suits, and, and, but I haven't coveted them. Right? Ralph's got a big farm. I haven't coveted, I like farms. I haven't coveted that. Right? Uh, Jack's got a fleet of Mustangs. I <laughs> and, uh, and I haven't coveted those. I like them. I like farms. I like nice cars. I, I like nice clothes. Right? Uh, yes. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Look out for the weak. Not just the poor, but the people who are weak. Sometimes it's emotional, whatever it is. 
And then look what comes next. And remember the words of Jesus. Clearly they all knew that Jesus said this even though it's not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That is a great Christmas message, of course. And I'll probably hammer on those kind of themes a little bit more uh, next week as the, uh, as the fourth Sunday of Advent. But I wanted to tell you this story. And I hope you see that, that by reviewing what Paul said when he was leaving, he said, let me go over with you how I have behaved from the beginning as a pastor. And so this is the beginning. Although I feel like I've been the pastor since June. Uh, you've been in our hearts since the uh, uh, Tuesday after your pastor resigned. Um, when we stopped by the Cornerstone office to drop off something, uh, traveling, we, we were still living in Falcon, and Brother Ainsworth said, come in and talk to me. He wasn't the superintendent yet. And I said, well, we're, we're getting ready to move up this way. And he said, well, we don't have any this or that. He said, but, uh, he said, I just got off the phone with the pastor of Tree of Life in Danville. <laughs> and something went, bing. It wasn't quite like the first time I saw her at camp meeting at Dublin. My heart did a... It, have you ever seen that thing Michael Jackson did when he went backwards? That's what... <laughs> moonwalk. That's what, <laughs> that's what my heart did uh, when I saw her on the other side of a thousand people. I saw her and went... Well, when he said that, something, and it's never left. It, I didn't know yet, but it's it just something about that. I didn't know much about the church. We'd come over one time came down in the parking lot years ago and prayed. Uh, I knew Brother Turner a little bit, and that's really all I knew. That's all I knew. Uh, and I knew you were on the wrong side of Danville because I knew we were going to live in Eden, and it would have been a lot nicer if y'all had been in Westover. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's really all I knew, all I knew. Um, and so the Lord put that in our heart, and it just got bigger every time we came. We just liked it. We liked y'all. Um, in fact, we liked you so much, we didn't like the fact we liked you so much uh, because we didn't know we'd get to stay. And our hearts had been broken some. We didn't feel like we wanted to go through anymore. And y'all seemed to like us, and we didn't want you to get this. I said, this, we got to stay. We don't want them to be discouraged. Uh, they seemed to like us for whatever reason. <laughs> and, uh, and so we prayed, and the Lord... And the Lord worked. I'll tell you sometime, it's just amazing how he worked it out. How he worked it out. It's continued. We didn't get it all worked out until Wednesday afternoon of this past week. To get all the, I mean, we knew we were coming, but we didn't get all the details worked out. Um, and so what I want to do is just share with you five prayers. And then I want you to come and, and just lay hands on us to conclude the service. And these are five prayers that I'd like for you to pray over me and pray over our family, pray over all the leaders, uh, including the ones who aren't here yet. Um, and these prayers are all drawn directly out of Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. Okay? To live, pray for us to live in a manner pleasing to the Lord, serving with humility and perseverance through in through any difficulties and disappointments. Those things come, right? And, and pray for us to lead, and for all of your leaders to be humble, not to think they're all that, not to think they know more than the conference or more than, or more than the pastor, or, and the pastor thinks he knows more than the superintendent and any of that, or the council thinks they know more than the pastor. We just, we need to respect each other and that starts, if you're not humble, you don't respect people, all right? So humility and perseverance means we're just not going to quit. We're just not going to quit. Um, everybody understand that second, that first one? 
And you can pray these over yourselves too, anytime you want to. Number two, to present from a heart of love the uncompromised truth of the gospel. To speak the truth in love. And the whole counsel of God to all people in all places. That I will say the same thing at a chamber of commerce meeting that I would in the prison cell. I say the same thing from this pulpit that I would say if I was asked to address some kind of a civic group. Uh, I'll say the same thing, uh, the same gospel, and that, I'll, uh, and that I'll speak it with love, both inside the church and outside in the community. Uh, number three, and, uh, and this is where Ralph would help me, but I was praying, Ralph, about two years ago. I said, Lord, what, a, what does it mean that pastors are shepherds? The pastor means shepherd, you know, pastor, pastor. Um, <clears throat> You know, a pastor is in charge of the pasture. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, the Lord dropped three ideas in my mind. To lead, feed, and protect. Lead, feed, and protect. So pray that I can lead, feed, and protect, and all your leaders as good shepherds, watching and warning, edifying. Remember to be built up in the most holy faith edifying and encouraging the precious ones Jesus gave his life to save. Number four, that we will run the race of God's calling faithfully and joyously to the end, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, whatever the cost. Uh, I've put a, a little prayer in there in parentheses that I learned when I received my PhD at the University of Mississippi, uh, the president was a Christian. And he's the one, we have a picture of him handing me my PhD in the basketball arena. Uh, and uh, uh, his name was Robert Kayat. He was Lebanese American. And at the time, when I was there 20 years ago, he was going through uh, threats, um, uh, uh, things were being done to his home and his car, death threats, because he had made a decision uh, to remove all the uh, Confederate references from the university. Uh, and uh, and uh, for example, uh, and he was and he was he would get threats on a regular basis, and he addressed a group of men that I was part of to do uh, prayer breakfasts once a week. And, um, and he made a statement. He said, this is how I pray. He said, every day I pray, Lord, show me what I need to do today. Because there are a thousand things that, I, that are pressing on me, but what do I need to do today? And then he said, give me the courage no matter what comes my way when I start to do it. And then give me the strength to get it done. Right? Three things. Clarity, courage, um, and strength. So if you would pray for me in that regard and, and for all the leaders that we will hear what the Lord wants done, that no matter what the opposition, we will, we will keep going uh, and, and that we will have the strength. And, and I mean emotional strength as well as physical strength. You know, sometimes you run, you, your will is still ready, but your body's about gone, right? And sometimes your, your, uh, your body's in good shape, but you just don't have the will. You just can't face it. Like, help us to be able to finish. And then number five, to be a living example of Jesus' words, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, I thought of Charles Dickens when I read that this morning. You know that, that one point when, when um, um, Ebenezer Scrooge is talking to, I think it's the third spirit, and, uh, and he has a, a, essentially a conversion. He realizes what kind of person he's been. You know, and, he says, and he says something along these lines that I may have Christmas in my heart and share it all year long, 
right? So this is a Christmas verse, if you will. We use it that way. My mother taught it to me that way, right? But is it a Christmas verse? Look at the context. The context is this is how leaders work in the church. This is how pastors operate. This is how denominational officials operate. This is how missionaries operate. We are to operate. We are there to give, and then the Lord will give back to us what we need. We're not there to get. A lot of people go into ministry either to get money, all right, or they go into ministry looking to get affirmation to fill their emotional needs. Well, either one of those makes a really sorry pastor, right? And makes a sorry Sunday school superintendent, a sorry youth pastor, a sorry worship pastor. Sorry, 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 right? And we don't need that. We've got to be a healthy church, right? It's more important for us to be healthy than to be big, right? When we are growing, then the church will grow on a healthy basis when we are growing. And what I'm asking you to do is to pray for me, pray for Gwen, pray for Danny, but pray for your council members, pray for those who are going to come. We're praying for someone uh, who can lead us with an instrument in worship. Uh, Brother Jimmy's doing a great job and will always be part of that, I hope, uh, ministry, but we need, uh, we need someone um, pretty soon to help us have a, a service for the children, a nursery. Sorry, we need that, right? And one day we need a, uh, we'll need a youth pastor. We already got uh, teenagers, right? We got quite a few, and I love them right now. They all seem to like me, so I'm kind of doing that job. Uh, but as we grow and they bring their friends, we'll need a youth pastor, and we all want to stay on the same page, right? We don't want to be uh, having our own little kingdoms or it, you, I want you to pray this humility, perseverance speaking the truth in love uh, living in a way that pleases God always wanting, knowing it's more blessed to give than to receive um, and so that's how I'd like for you to pray for us and I'd like to encourage you to cut this bottom off or just fold this and stick it in your Bible or a uh, or uh, put it on your refrigerator door or someplace, uh, and, you know, wherever you go to be alone, that would remind you to pray. Uh, how often can you, uh, do I want you to pray for your pastor at least once a day, right? At least once a day. Uh, and, and what am I going to pray for you? This is what I'm praying to represent us. This is how I want us to be. To me, this is a healthy church. The reason, what you see underlying this conversation between Paul and the Ephesian elders and why it says they prayed for, he prayed for them and then they fell on each other's necks weeping knowing they would not see him again. They respected each other. We have to respect each other. And it takes humility to respect other people. As long as you think you know more than others, you can't respect them. It doesn't mean that you don't say, well, I think somebody's wrong about something, but, but you respect them. We listen to each other. We pray for each other. We talk nice to each other, right? Uh, I think if we could see the stab wounds that some people leave with emotionally when they've been to church. <laughs> uh, I have seen people take off almost running out of church having only been there uh, less than five minutes. And I'll, you know, as a pastor, I'd always go investigate. I mean, that hasn't happened here. And it was always, I walked in and I had this place of hurt and somebody walked right over and stabbed me in it. Right? That, that comes from a lack of respect. So we've got to respect each other. Is that okay? Look, Y'all looking at me like, like, you know, are we going to sing at the end of this funeral? 
you know. <laughs> right. Does everybody get that? All right. What I'd like.